Well, good morning, everyone. I guess I can, except for if, if anyone who is outside the United States and Canada, I'm, I'm thinking. So um, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to speak with you again, and I want to thank everybody who's taken their time to listen to two hours of cost accounting. It's truly an indication you probably don't have a lot else to do, but I, I think cost accounting is fun, and it's also one of the, or fun's a relative term, of course, but it's also one of the hardest, uh, the hardest aspects of the product to get to, because up until this version, it was multiple modules you had to look at up and set up. So the body of knowledge was kind of tough to actually acquire because there was no one book on it. So I've been doing these cost accounting kind of sessions for quite a long time, and I did 40 hours of, of, of them uh, not too long ago. Uh, just in, It was early two years ago. So think of those people. You're only two hours. They were four hours, which leads me to uh, uh, who I am. I'm Don Riggs. I've been in the industry for 30 plus years. We like to say that we should be able to say we're 50 plus years old, but I've got been working with, with uh, AX for 15. Uh, I've always been, I, although I've helped sales, I've primarily been on the delivery side my entire career because that's where I think the action is. Uh, so I've had many successful ERP implementations and different products, not just um, AX or, or F&O, I was APEX certified in the early 80s. I think that kind of dates me a little bit. And I've actually helped design ERP systems earlier in my career. And in fact, I designed a rate-based production system and a rate-based cost system, which really is a predecessor to what we call lean manufacturing. And so that was fairly early in the game. We, we called it just in time at that point. Um, I also write regularly for MS Dynamics World, regular participant in AXUG, <clears throat> and I've specialized in costing and costing processes because I always felt there was a need there for someone to do that. And I tend to gravitate towards what other people are not that interested in, but there is a need because I think that's kind of always a sweet spot on how you want to look at things, you know, the challenge is what I think is the most fun thing for me. And by the way, I'm a production uh, a consultant by trade, but I branched out into a lot of other areas. Okay, so what we're going to do here, first I want to suggest to you there's 104 slides in this deck. We're probably not going to get through all of them, so we'll figure out, uh, you'll get the slide deck and we can maybe do a subsequent or we'll figure out how many we can get to this additional content. But what we're doing is we're going to review the manufacturing cost theory, including standard costs. And for some of you, some of these areas will be somewhat repeated. So I'm going to go through those a little bit faster. But, you know, we want to be fair to the people that are, this is their first session also. Uh, we're going to look at standard cost theory. We're going to review the setups. Then we're going to get into the cost roll-up process. The cost roll-up process is how we arrive at a cost for a manufactured good. And that's what we're going to cover. And I think I've, I've got a pretty comprehensive way of, of illustrating that for you. Then we're going to look at how it works within the manufacturing environment. What happens when we, when we post these transactions? And then how does that result in a, a, a variance? those kind of things. Uh, also, <clears throat> if you're before 2009, I believe, or no, before 2012, I believe, you had to run a process to update the value of your inventory at standard cost. I believe in 2012 is when the first time it started occurring is they actually produced a posting when you change the standard cost, which is what most systems had done in my, my history that I was familiar with. That kind of, we no longer needed to run that process, but if you're pre-2012, then there is a process for revaluing standard cost. <clears throat> and then lastly, things you must do to maintain a good standard cost environment. Because any costing structure you need to work on, 
it, there's no automatics, and that includes in, in any actual costing system, too. Oh, hit the wrong button, evidently. Okay, review of manufacturing cost theory. Okay, so if you look at the elements of any production, you have materials, which is the materials that are issued and consumed within the manufacturing process. You have the labor, and labor can be either people labor or you can charge out machine time against a process. And then you have overhead, and overhead is an allocation of other expenses that can be related to the production process. An example of overhead would be the power you use in the production process, so the floor space you use. So that's the kind of things where we're trying to then capture other manufacturing expense and bring them directly into the product. A lot of conversations on this, and you'll find a lot of different opinions. What it really boils down to is the overhead application's got to be fair. We're trying to compete in a worldwide market space, so we need to compare apples uh, to apples. So overhead is, is something that you need to take a look at. But generally, it's the total cost of the manufacturing allocated to a dollars per hour is the most often way I've seen it. But it also can be driven by materials. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, all right production order costing at standard. These are just the processes. When we do an issue, we're issuing material, we're posting labor, and then we're gonna calculate and post overhead. So what that does is that becomes a debit to WIP, a credit to those other processes. When we do the report is finished, we effectively receive the physical inventory at standard cost, keep in mind, this is a production order costing at standard. When we do a production end, we receive the financial inventory at standard cost. In other words, what it does is reverses it out, posts it back in at standard, and we also then post our variances. When you're working with standard cost systems, what happens is that the inventory coming out of the production process is at standard, any cost over and above, or what's almost easier to say, if I take material out at standard, whatever's left over, positive and negative, positive or negative, comes out as a variance. So at the end of a production order, your whip value should be zero. Okay, so this is really what it looks like. You've got material labor and overhead coming into this, and what comes out is receipts at standards. And, and when the production order is ended, we post a variance. And I just wanted to jazz up the presentation. That's why we do these graphics, right? Um, <clears throat> the, now, this is non-standard. Now, when we say non-standard, I want to make sure that we're, we're, it's standard in what's called fixed unit. And what that is is the old version of standard cost. So we're talking about LIFO, FIFO, weighted average, weighted average date, and all those actual costing methods, so to speak. Actual costing, the, only, the actual cost is homogenized through the costing system after it comes out of the production order. But the total cost coming out of the production order is applied to the item we're manufacturing. So when we look at it, we still have the same thing on the production issue side. We receive the physical inventory at estimated cost. And what estimated cost is, is the current routing and bill of materials rolled up within the production order that produces an estimated cost. Then we receive at the production end, we receive the financial inventory at what we can call an actual cost. Because it's the total cost that's been posted to the production order divided over that that came out of the production order. And there are some exceptions to that, and we're going to talk about scrap. But, but scrap, if you use the allocation of scrap, it's, it's allocated then over whatever comes out of that production order. Is this about the right pace for everybody? I don't see anything. Okay. I think it's good. I don't know. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm not yeah. – uh, I've got several responses saying, yep, this looks good. Oh, okay. See, I don't see that, right? Okay. No, you don't. It's in the question box. Okay, got it. That's okay. 
That's okay. It's kind of, you, I'm sure you could imagine, those of you, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have presented, one of the things we do when we're teaching that we can't do in this situation is look at the feedback. You know, I can tell if you're awake. <laughs> tell if you're, but, <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, I'll just, I'll continue on and just I like to check every now and again because like, you like positive feedback on what you do. Yeah. So now if we look at the production order, receive it plans cost, what we said. So, so that's when the individual receipts, so when the production order is entered, the costs that are left are added to the financial costs. So in theory, you could post it, the receipt, at one cost, you're going to reverse that out. The actual one is based on your production performance. So if you really think about it, the a, a, a report, is pro, report is finished process is at a, an estimated kind of cost. It says this we think is going to cost us. The other one is what it really cost us. And that's important. Another thing I want to make sure that people understand, you do not have to wait for it to be ended to transact against it. You don't even have to have issued the material if you've done a report is finished. A lot of people think that these things are, are synchronized. No, it's an async process. What's important though, is you should try to post your transaction as timely as you can, because there's a lot of other things at stake. And then you want to make sure, obviously you're reporting correctly coming out of report is finished. And before you end the production order, you want to make sure that everything has been posted so you get a good outcome on that part of the process. But keep in mind, the system's quite capable of once I do this report is finished, just transacting against that inventory. Okay, so so is the production force posting. Okay, so when we look at materials, the offset is some manner of inventory, and the, the it's a picking list process, and it's materials issued or materials back flushed. And let me explain for those of you who may not know back what back flush is. Back flush is a process of of automatically relieving inventory from usually a point of of, of execution within a production area. So rather than issuing the materials, I can back flush the materials. So automatically issue them is what it means. If I'm automatically issuing them, I also can control when they're issued. Although it's commonly known as back flush, we break it into what's called pre-flush and back flush. Think of pre-flush flush happens on the beginning of the process, back flush happens at the end of the process, and the most effective back flush is when we do it with regards to what we've reported as finished. Now, having said that, you're more likely to use pre-flush in a batch type of environment where you're, you're making chemicals or those types of things. You're more likely to use a back flush in a discrete menu process where you're issuing discrete products, and the outcome is pretty well dedicated. You don't have yield loss in that. You either made one or you didn't. So scrap reporting becomes very important in that. Now, the other thing I want to express is now in labor, and this is confusing because some people get these wrong, the offset should be a direct labor applied account. A direct labor applied says this is the component of direct labor that I've applied to manufacturing. You have the same concept in projects, and you have the same, and really what it does is bounces up against the actual payroll, and it gives you the idea of how much, uh, how much other time people are spending re with, with, not with that in manufacturing that is not directly applied to the production order. Uh, also, I want to encourage people: labor and routings are very important. And labor component, I have I have people say all the time, we don't need a routing because there isn't much labor. Uh, c content. I still say it is some. It should be represented, and there's other reasons why you need that. You need you need routings to establish lead times. So therefore, even if the small labor component, you can use moving queue times to really represent that flow through the manufacturing uh, operation. Uh, by the way, I, I teach a lot of production scheduling capacity planning too. That's where the spotting knowledge is coming from. So. Overhead then is the offset is direct labor applied, and then effectively the resultant process of labor postings and material postings, because it's driven by a percentage of those things, and we'll cover that in more detail later. Okay, 
Then we look at report is finished, the offset is inventory, the cost is posted at estimated cost, unless it's standard cost, and then it posts a standard. And then an end, again, the offset is inventory, and effectively, I think the developers were paid by the number of transactions, because what it does is reverses out everything that happened before and reverses it back in, and then it will post to the financial, uh, financially completed, and also at the end is when you will also produce a variance, because that's when you, you have your total accumulated cost, so you know what the variance should be. Understanding the roll-up process. So let's do this. Okay. So what a cost roll-up does is it's saying, what does the product cost me based on my bill of materials and routings is really what it does. So what it does is it goes through the active bills of material and calculates the cost of materials and then puts them in buckets. And we're gonna talk about those buckets later, but you could have one bucket called material. But as long as you understand, you can also break those buckets out into other material groupings. Then it goes through the act of routing and copies the labor cost based on projected time per unit, which is tied to some manner, a cost category, and it also puts it in cost groupies. So you can further define your labor. And what's amazing to me, everybody wants exceptional details or even too much detail on their labor. And most of the time, they'll put materials in one bucket. I think both are fairly important. But as long as you understand the concepts of what you can do, that's all I'm striving for here. Okay, then it goes through the cost sheet and calculates the overhead based on the information of postings of materials in labor, and also puts them in cost groupings. So the result is a detailed cost per unit. Now that can be a standard cost or a planned cost. And let me explain the difference. Standard cost you have to have. Planned cost you want to have. The reason why you want to have it is that we'll use plan cost in absence of any other cost, and we'll cover that a little bit more later. But you should have in a good uh, costing system, you should either, if you're not on standard cost, you should have a plan cost. It also is a point of, point of um, where you can, you can compare transactions against this plan cost. That's why it's so very important. <clears throat> okay, the difference between a single level roll up in a multi-level roll up is the single level goes one level deep. And I'm gonna illustrate what that looks like. And whereas the multi-level calculates up through the sub bombs. So there's a big difference between the two because if I have a single level and something changes in a sub bomb, that is not reflective in a single level. That may or may not be desired, but you, you need to understand what the capabilities are around this, okay? Okay, yeah, and this is very important too. Standard, a lot of times I'll get people uh, say, look, uh, I got a variance and I perform to standard. Well, if you think about standard cost, Standard cost is established the last time you activate it as a standard cost. Remember that your bombs and routings are based on current, uh, current known uh, uh, bombs and routing. So I could have changed the routing, in other words, to, to make it more accurate. That doesn't mean I change the standard cost. So as long as you understand there's a difference in time, standard cost is established when we, when we activate a new standard cost. And it uses that until the next time we activate a new standard cost. Okay, so here's a concept of multi-level bills. This is the item we're building. We need these items here. Then this item we're building is a also has to be produced and it needs these items below it. 
This is a multi-level bill of materials. The thing I want to make sure that you know is this is not an art. There's no architecture that's a multi-level bill of materials. It's a representative. It's a representation of two bills of materials. And let me kind of illustrate what I'm talking about there. Here is the single level bill of materials for the T0012, P004, D003, T001. When I roll this up at a single level, it's gonna take my standard cost from here, my standard cost from here, or plan cost depending, and my standard cost from here, and it's gonna roll it up to here. Now, if I take the D003, and this is what it looks like in the system, a single level, it's going to roll these costs up. Now, what's important to note, let me see if I can go back to previous, is that if something changed in the Z003, at the material level, a single level will not see that unless the Z003 was rolled up previous to the roll up for here. I hope that makes sense. As long as we understand single level is gonna take what the cost is at that level, multi-level is gonna run roll through the whole architecture. It's important to note that standard cost can only be activated on a single level roll up. And we're gonna cover that a little bit later, but really what, the, in fact, I'm pretty sure uh, that we'll cover that too. But you get the idea that Single level operates different than multi-level. So let me illustrate how I use those. I will typically set an engineering cost up that allows me to do a cost roll up, multi-level or single level, because I can do either one in a planned cost environment, but I don't let them activate it. The best way to know if your bills and routings are good and uh, you, when you launch a production order, it's going to work, is to do a cost roll-up. Cost roll-up makes sure your bills are set up correctly or relative correctly, your routes are set up, and you have some, a, point, a point of reference to say, I came up with this cost, is this correct? Because remember, since it comes from these elements, it's pretty important to understand those elements, and it's pretty important to use that feature before we actually launch a production order and uh, with a hope for the best strategy. Really all I'm showing here is how the material cost gets accumulated. I'm not gonna cover the whole thing, but there's something that you need to understand, which we're gonna cover in a little more detail. See this purchase overhead cost here. In 2009, this didn't exist, but 2012 going forward, it did. What we had, is the ability to add an overhead to the purchasing process. Uh, what that really meant is now we, for the first time, rather than using miscellaneous charges, we had a vehicle that would allow uh, an allowance for freight, maybe handling and other types of things as a freight allocation that would automatically be added to the standard cost and even one step further it can automatically then post on the purchase order to become part of the material cost. And so that works for either act, actual or standard. So it can incorporate other elements other than the purchase price is the one I'm trying to point out to you. All right. And that was been a big complaint on the standard cost. We'll cover a little bit more about how that occurs, but it does incorporate this purchase overhead cost and what it's doing to calculate is material unit cost of 393. So what we've got is 153.08 of purchase cost, $3.06 of overhead cost. So the total cost of material is 156.14. If we look at labor, we talked about the number of units per hour. It's 780 per hour. And here's something really important to understand. You also this, uh, this have this concept of resource load. So it's 100%. So really, what you do is divide four into 780, you come up with 195. Now, the only thing that I wanna point out here 
<clears throat> is here we have in the secondary operation have a resource load of 40%. What that means is that it's only 40% of the resources time they're actually applying it to this particular production process. Uh, so again, <clears throat> we're saying that this resource can be working on two, two production orders at the same time. So we're only using 40%. That also does affect the cost. So that's something else that's very important to understand. So when we look at overhead, we look at, what, this is really more of a, an amortization rather than depreciation as far, of, as far as I'm concerned, but we're charging a rate of $1.50 per unit as an overhead unit cost. A lot of times I'll see calculations like this if I'm trying to amortize a tool, like a tool might be good for 30,000 or 300,000 strikes, let's say. I might charge out at a so much per unit cost to amortize the cost of that tool into the cost of the materials it's producing. Um, <clears throat> in the one, we have a surcharge of 3%. So a surcharge represents a percentage, you'll see, and a rate present represents a dollar or unit cost. So if we looked at, a, a, and also by the way, it uses it on the material cost, not the material cost inclusive of overhead but it takes the 3% of the material cost and then it creates an overhead factor of uh, 459 unit cost. Again, I think that these presentations more like when you go through an example, you'll be able to see how the costs get accumulated. But I think you get the idea of what I'm showing here. I'm showing you actually a breakdown and then that results <clears throat> in what this looks like. So you'll see that, <clears throat> excuse me, on the wiring harness, I've got an overhead of 0 0.08. So therefore, there's your purchase cost, there's your overhead cost for a material cost of 393. You go down a little bit farther, you'll see your process cost, and then you'll see your overhead cost as I've uh, presented in those previous more detailed breakdowns. All right, now here's the other thing. This is showing you exactly the same thing, but with regard to the cost sheet. The cost sheet allows me to define and define how this looks. So I can control what the output of this looks like through the costing sheet, and I'll show you that later. But also I've decided that I've defined an M1 as I wanna break out electronic components versus cabinets versus miscellaneous components. Uh, this is, like I said, a very often underused capability, but I think it's an important one because if I'm looking at variants rather than have to look at all my materials, it's kind of nice to break it into a group. And also, I may see a particular class of products that maybe my standards aren't very, very good. So I can also look at this over time to see where my standards might be need to improve. And of course, I can break down the labor similar and then my plan overhead. Okay, yes. Now I have some group questions, okay? The first question, what should be the value remaining in WIP after production or production or batch order is ended? Julie, are we getting any responses? Oh, we are. Uh, okay. We've got about four, five, six folks that say zero or none. Well, pretty much everybody now. Yeah. Okay, good. That's that's exactly right. None. And that's why it's very important. Your setups reflect that. Your financial setups can actually force your WIP balance out of balance. And it also can force your inventory balance with regard to the ledger, regard to the actuals out of balance. So these setups are very important. If they're set up correctly though, in absolutely zero, all the costs come out of production order when you end it. Uh, next question, how do you fit a, for, fix a production order that is ended? Anybody? You can't, you don't. Yep, and, and you're right. 
The answer is you don't. Now, the reason why is that's why it's very important <clears throat> that cost accounting have an oversight on closing production orders because once they're closed, you can fix as a relative term. You can't fix the production order. You can kind of fix what happened, but here's the problem. It takes you, it's a lot of, you know, you're going to invest a lot of time to do it. So you can fix the, you can't fix the production order, but you can fix some of the results is what I'm saying. Okay, and next is what is the purpose of accept error flag on the report is finished process? Anybody know? Enter the question box if you think you might have an answer. When the cost variance is too large? Don't know. <laughs> okay, well, let me explain. Yep. First off, we don't recommend you use it. But here's when you can you you can use it. If you look at how a production order is structured, it says, okay, I'm going to use so much material, I'm going to use so much labor, that will uh, uh, the outcome will produce so much overhead. If you let's say <clears throat> post 80% of the materials, and let's say I didn't complete an operation step. When I try to do the, what the report is finished with accept error, it will give me an error if those are not produced, okay? There are ways to fix that by ending the operation and, and uh, ending how much on the, in the term end may not be the one, but it's basically saying, I'm not gonna issue any more materials. So it's a discipline that needs to be in place. But if for some reason, those things didn't happen, it'll give you an error. You can override it, but I'm suggesting you should go in and, and fix it rather than just overriding. And if you're overriding it, understand why. Okay, the why may be, well, we're not gonna post any more labor. You have ways to do that independent of that, but the bottom line is that it is there. If all, the point that I'm making, if it's turned on and it can be turned on in the parameters table, Turn it off, particularly if you're going to let production close or end production orders, because then they can't end it if they didn't finish something. Okay, so I like to just throw those things out every now and again, just to spice things up. Okay, affects the scrap, and we actually did pretty good on time, I think. The Two concepts of scrap is the allocation and scrap account. Scrap account's been around for a lot of years. In fact, we used to use scrap accounts because the theory said, when I look at a production order variance, I want to exclude things that got scrapped in the process because I'm trying to say, how did I perform against what I produced? Well, that was an old way of thinking, and so you'd hit the scrap expense, but the scrap expense now was something you'd kind of have to add back in because now that's no longer associated with that item that's produced. The allocation method says, I'm going to allocate the total cost against units reported. So what that means, if I started 10 and I issued 10 10 parts worth of materials, and I ended up only produce, if I produce nine and scrapped one, it will put, it will use the cost of the 10 to be a, a portion across the nine, which is more representative of what the cost of those materials coming out. So I haven't set a scrap account situation up in a lot of years, quite frankly, most of the time you'll see allocation, where I'm allocating across the, the good pieces produce the total cost that went into the, into the production order. Okay, so now we're going to just go in through a little more detail. Some of this is review or a redundancy for the other. I'll go through this pretty, for, pretty quickly. Here's a routing. So the first step is an assembly step. I break out that assembly step and it says, okay, what 
what it is is the assembly is in runtime. So assembly is a type of cost category, and it's going to occur at runtime. So you'll notice you have setup, run, and quantity. Run is when you post labor against the regular process. Quantity is based on quantity produced. Setup, you have to implicitly post the setup. That cost carrier assembly is has a cost price of seven seven eighty and comes from a costing group L two, and L two is what gets tied then to the financial costing system or the cost accounting system. And effectively, then you also set the category price <clears throat> within a physical period, so it works very much similar to how you activate cost on a material cost. You also activate cost on category price costs, and they can have a from and to date, so they can have a history of cost. Okay, we covered on some of this, but uh, routings, again, they provide the ability for labor overhead. You can back flush them if you don't wanna post them. People say, well, I can't post labor because there's too, it takes too much time and all this kind of stuff. Well, you can back flush it. At least you're getting the labor component in there. <clears throat> They're necessary to provide scheduling capacity planning capabilities within your production order. And also, they, they actually create the lead time calculation. So they're very important on actually properly representing the date of need so that within your planning system, they, you, it helps you drive when you need to order it by to get there at a time. <clears throat> here is your production posting. So what I'm showing you here is that you've got material consumption, route consumptions, report is finished. So within the product, oh, by the way here, I just added these. So you have a point of relevance of where this occurred, where I was at when I was doing these operations. So I just added these uh, just to start doing that so you get a better idea of where this is. Now, unfortunately, the, 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 the trail here is not as, is not as comprehensive as I would like it in, a, in the, the system, but Clearly, it, it's part of the production posting and actually would be from the costing section. At least you know where to go start looking. Okay, so, so when we look at here, here is your estimated. So estimated came out to 168 in this case. And then here is, I'm just showing you some outputs of how these things look. And here's your 187. In your, and that's your actual costing. So I wanna make sure you understand that in your costing section, you have some valuable information regarding what happens with regard to your costing system. And we'll tie this all together later, or at least you'll have the documentation and tie this all together a little bit later. Okay. <clears throat> Cost accounting has us have some manner of oversight. Now, <clears throat> I don't care how you go about that as long as you understand that a production a production order should be closed and have all the cost. So when I say oversight, at least some way of identifying before they're closed. Make sure everything's posted. The biggest problem, you know, is not everything's posted. You got journals out there. Whether the journals were needed or not, they have to be posted before you can end. <clears throat> You want to identify your costing problems before you post. There's some other things that are important to note. You should not have a production order span more than one financial period when possible. And that has to do with the timeliness of financial uh, inventory uh, versus physical inventory. Uh, and all the, all this, the other ones, just statement. Again, you want to close your production orders in the same period. In other words, <clears throat> if you got a production order that you just leave out there to make the same thing over and over again, that's a bad practice. You should create new production orders. Now, sometimes we can't avoid it. We can be bu building a product that will span multiple financial periods. If you're building, a, let's say, a ship and you're trying to deal that through production process, 
in theory, you could have production orders that would span for longer than a financial period. And generally, you don't. Uh, improve your standards. Understand your costs and try to improve your standards because you're otherwise you're fooling yourself. Variance, the reason why we have variance is so you can look at it and then try to figure out, is this a trend or is this a one-time type of situation or why did it happen? Um, and also then when you talk about batch orders and we're talking about process manufacturing, you have other considerations, costing considerations like uh, the co-products and byproducts. And I don't want to get into it, but obviously co-products create an interesting costing uh, scenario and, and usually there are ways that you cost, you allocate the total cost across your, your co-products is what you're doing. You're using an allocation methodology to share that cost of production cost. Anybody that doesn't know what co-products are? Anybody? Just enter in the question box, co-products. Mm -hmm. Nothing there. Everybody must move. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. Standard cost theory. Okay, elements of purchase cost. We talked about the material cost and allocation of expenses. That's what that new piece was on. Up until that time, we used up until that cost where we had in 2012 where we could do a purchasing roll-up, we would typically allocate expenses through miscellaneous charges. And for those of you who know miscellaneous charges, they can add to your inventory value. So I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't mean my wife uh, is bringing me something to drink. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, so when we look at purchase order costing it at standard, Emory posted, posted a standard cost. Offset is typically a purchasing accrual account. Expenses are allocated at this point when we do the vendor invoice, so they're not they're, they don't happen until that. Inventory is posted to standard costs and purchase price variance is posted. So it's the purchase cost plus these expenses allocated that produce the cost that's used to drive the variance over under. Okay, so purchase order received, inventory standard cost, purchase price variance. Cost breakdown. Again, we covered material, labor, and indirect cost when we talk about cost breakdown. Uh, and really, it enables tracking of a standard and planned and within estimated and actual cost. So what we're saying is this breakdown is consistent through these processes is what it really says. Okay, we talk about indirect cost, cost not directly attributed to a production process. They're usually defined as fixed or variable, and there's one or two reports that allow you to break this out, but a fixed is a cost that doesn't change with production throughput. A fixed cost would be floor space, uh, that kind of thing. If we're a variable cost that changes with the production throughput, that could be something like electric, electric costs, maybe depending on my process, uh, if I was doing a making steel, um, I would be using a lot of electricity. Uh, so therefore, the more my production, more my production, the more electricity I'll use. And really, the definition is through the costing sheets. A little history, up until the, uh, up until the costing sheet, which occurred in 2009, we had no way to get overhead in there. We had creative ways, but uh, but you either had to post it as separate or you had to post a part of your your production costs and break it out on the back end. Okay, production order. We've kind of covered this, so really what we're doing here, again, what I did is concatenated some stuff from yesterday to this one, but really what this says is, okay, I receive it standard and post variances. And we've covered that one. Okay. And we've covered this. So that tells you where your production posting comes. Now we're getting into <clears throat> the true standard cost setup. Now these are setups 
that are somewhat unique to standard cost. But we're going to cover the whole costing elements, and there's some things later on that are unique. Okay. We're good. Good, Don, it's ten, yeah. almost 10 to the hour. Do you want to take a 10-minute break now? Is this a good time, or do you want to continue on for a few more minutes? Your choice. Yeah, yeah, I think this is a good time. Let me look through. I may jump ahead if we've – see, you're always – you're always trying to say, well, you want to make sure that you're not too redundant for the people who took the other class, but for people that this is their, they didn't go to the other one, you want to kind of cover. So uh, if anybody's got any comments about the level of detail or redundancy, go ahead and make them, and maybe I'll take a look at moving a little bit forward. But I kind of like to review these elements. So it's there's reinforcement that you can use that makes it, so that there's more retention. So if it's too tedious, let me know, but otherwise I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Okay? All right, so you think we should take a 10 minute break now? Yeah, let's go ahead. All yeah. right, let's do that. We'll start again at the top of the hour. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, please enter them in the question box and we'll address them before we begin again. All right, talk to you soon.
Hey, John, I'm back. Okay. Well, uh, we'll start in just a couple minutes, but we don't have sure. any questions in the box, so. Okay. Uh, just okay. a couple about, you know, is the uh, PowerPoint going to be available? And I've been answering those on my own, you know, so. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I think you will probably be good to just continue on once we, and I'll let you know about one minute. Okay, and that sounds good. And if there's additional content, we'll move it around or we'll give it to them. I mean, they're you know, they, they'll get, it's just, it's tough to cover, you know, we're not, we're trying to cover the same amount in half the time. And so, uh, but I want to make sure they get the content is what uh, the whole idea is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's going. I think it's it going. Well. Like it's going well. I think. Um, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay. All looks good. Nobody's, nobody's left yet, yeah. anyway. We right? do have. Uh, no, we, they haven't. We do have one question. I think we should just yeah. uh, answer it now. And sure. it's from Nizim, and he asks: Will setting up costing module require setup in inventory procurement production? That's all he says. So I don't know if. That. Okay. Well, here's what I'd like to suggest. It depends on what version he's talking about. If you look at D365, you have a thing called cost management now. And that's something they should have had a long time ago. And and it's not the same. You'll also see a section called cost accounting. Yeah, he's the not... X2012 R3. Sorry, David. Oh, okay. Okay. And then he doesn't have that. So you, he's right. You have to be setting up the areas we have to set up. You have to set up in production. That's where you set up your production, your routings, and your cost groups and everything that for production. You'll set up in inventory management. And I believe, if I remember right, the area of that is in the bill of materials section or the cost section, depending on what version you're in. I think 2012, there was actually a cost section. And we're in uh, also in, but in before 2012, I think it was in the bill material section. Uh, then uh, we covered that, that, and what's the third one? Um, production, inventory, and I said the other one earlier, and I'm trying to procurement. Procurement, yeah. There's some. There's some there too. All right, great. Okay, sorry, I didn't. I didn't design it, <laughs> but that's why I tried to put the links wherever possible. But right. yeah, the earlier versions, everything I'm talking there. Well, actually, what I tried to do is where there's a difference. That's why I do the historical things that I do because I want to make sure that people know that earlier versions you're not going to see it because there's still people. <laughs> I don't know how far the farthest one I I had. Re fairly recently, they were still back in version three, but generally most people are at least at 2009 now. Most, but a lot of them have customizations. You know, we still got some version fours and version threes out there. I know. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're at time, so let's continue on. No question. Yeah. Uh, other outstanding issue questions. Yeah. By the way, for anyone on still on four and three, you just got to find an old consultant. So I qualify. So, so, so uh, okay. So let's proceed on with uh, standard cost setup. And I'm just going to cover uh, the way that I would normally do it. So again, we talked about costing versions, and they create the they create user defined environments. And the thing that I want to suggest that they're not uh, they're underutilized. It was designed. The reason why you have the ability to add costing versions is that well, they wanted to give you the capability of doing things like cost cost modeling or let's say there's some requirements sometimes where you need a an, a second costing method so you might be operating in FIFO but maybe you need to have a represented LIFO cost you could create a costing version for LIFO you just wouldn't activate it and then you could use that as part of your reporting or exporting out to a spreadsheet or something like that okay so this, the types are plan cost, and that means I can, a plan cost is what I can use in other costing methods other than standard. And so a plan cost, I can roll up a standard product with the, with the plan cost and actually do a multi-level roll up 
I just cannot activate it. So you can do comparisons by <clears throat> rolling up the item with the plan cost, then turning around and rolling up the item with the standard cost, and you can see what the differences are. So do that and uh, uh, in your spare time. So, but it's interesting to see that if costs change below, it doesn't necessarily change above. And <clears throat> and I understand in in uh, in uh, D365. They fix this somehow, and I want to test it. I meant to do it before this session, but I will before next session. But one of the problems, if you're trying to do a full roll-up, okay, because I get asked this question a lot, I want to roll up all my costs. Let's say I've changed over the year. I want to roll it up to new standard cost. Here's what your problem is. It does not roll in any specific order unless you segmented inventory by grouping to be able to enable it. So here's what I, I'm going to suggest to you. Unless you can group some hierarchical grouping, you'll have to roll up the cost as many times as you have depth in your bill of materials. So therefore, if your bomb is five levels deep, you'd have to totally roll the cost five times to be absolutely insured you got all your cost. <clears throat> and so, because remember, it's, it, it rolls them unless you want to control that. Now, supposedly in 365, they have another cost roll capability that I want to research uh, that is new to 365. But in general, the, if that's, I want to make you aware of that. So if you've got a, a, a bomb five levels deep, first off, I would say try to flatten it if you can. But you need to understand that when you roll all the cost, they just pick them and I, there's no particular way that it's gonna pick those items. So it just rolls them as it's, it, they come across. So it's not a standard, not everything is rolled up through the process in the first pass is what I'm suggesting, okay? <clears throat> uh, and all I'm saying is you can use that costing version on any item and you can activate it. It's just you can only activate a standard cost item from a standard cost roll. And there is a conversion type that's used in converting from a previous costing versions to the new standard cost versions or other cost versions. Okay. <clears throat> so these are just some consideration. We talked about them. Okay. You can use you can use them interchangeably. The only limitation, plan or standard, the only limitation is you can only activate a standard cost from a standard cost costing type. That's the only limitation. Also, it, it, you know, the standard cost can only do a single level roll. So you need to understand that. So it doesn't roll up all the way through. It rolls up. So you'd have to roll up what's under it and then roll up the, the, uh, the item above it. Um, you know, again, we talked about the multi-level roll-up that plan costs can do. And the other one, now this is a subtle thing that you need to, that, that, that I, want, I want to appreciate. You have the, a way of fixing a date in your system so that it'll post the cost to that date. Let me explain where that's used. <clears throat> if I have a... Um, a new standard cost or a new item, let's say. And for whatever reason, I roll it up and let's say there's a zero cost when I rolled it up because they didn't have things in there. If I activated that zero cost at the beginning of the year and I rolled it up and realized my mistake and rolled it up 10 days later, I might have transacted that zero cost and nothing's going to fix that. I'm going to have to, if there's a way to fix it, I'll, I want to stress that. But clearly, you have to be concerned about the timing of these costing activations, particularly in new systems with new parts. The way to combat that is you can set it so it starts at the first of the year. Then later in the year, you can, in fact, um, uh, relax that and make it post the date uh, the, the date that it's that it actually happened. Let me show you where the setup is. I hope I've properly projected why you might want to do it. It should make sure you don't leave a hole in your costing system. But it doesn't. You don't have to have everything start the first date at the first of the year, particularly if you want to do uh, 
uh, look at the costing history. Okay, so costing test version setup, you can see standard cost. And here's where you got, these are wide open. On this one, it's not blocked, so you can do a roll up, but you can, or change the cost, but you can't activate it. So that's an example of one you might have out there. This was, this is a future period, is what they're trying to present here. Okay, here's the from date. So that's what this recording restriction is. What it says, if I set this, it's gonna post the cost for the effective the first of the year. That's again, to try to avoid a hole in the costing system. And that's all they're trying to do here. So rather than it still tracks what date you actually did the activation, it just makes it as of 1-1, 2017. Uh, it also say what prices am I gonna allow them to set from here. Then on the costing, the, uh, the calculation, it's saying <clears throat> production, purchase order, restrict calculation says, I'm gonna use these values. If I turn this off, it will use the calculation group and I'll show you what those are shortly. I recommend you use the calculation group. Item price setup from this costing version, I can see my item price, my cost category price, or my indirect cost. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you can manage these other areas right from here. So if we look at the item price, these are all my items in that costing. So it's one way I can, let me just go back. I can be in this costing version and see all my item prices or my cost category prices or my indirect calculations right from this cost version. Okay, that's what we're showing here. Cost groups. What it defines is the type of cost and they're broken down to direct materials, direct manufacturing, direct, uh, direct outsourcing and indirect. All this really means if it's set up for direct materials, it's available on the material setup. If it's, if it's identified as direct manufacturing, it's a, a, it'll be available in the production routings sections, all right? So it's a basic building block. So when you look at the costing itself outside the production order, or even in the production order, because you can see it represented by these cost groups, that is what drives the process on the back end, uh, but there, it's a relationship. It's a uh, it can be a many to one or a one to many relate, or a, it's a many to one relationship. So you can have one costing uh, group that can handle multiple items. Okay, so it is basically how you associate them. So here's the cost groups you'll notice that this one is set up for direct materials. You also get to find it as the default. So what that means is that if I don't associate one at the item level, if this is the default, that's what it will use. That's all it's really saying here. Here's the item assignment. So it's on the, uh, So it's basically, here it is on the costing. This is in the cost section on the release product. You can assign the cost group there. Say cost categories, we kind of uh, went through this. It's really how it works. The cost categories is what is associated to the routing. So let me go through the illustration here. The cost group is associated to a cost category you also have a cost category price that you can associate with this. On the routing, it's either gonna be hitting at setup, run, or quantity on the routing. So that's the association you need to establish to get the cost 
in the routing. That's the labor cost or you've got a cost of the quantity cost, which means it's based on the quantity produced. In other words, one time the quantity would be what would hit from that cost category. So here's your cost category group assignment. We're seeing that cost category assemblies associated cost group L2 is what we're seeing here. Calculation groups. They support the cost relevant function. You'll notice that you can do them from the cost version, but the cost category has a lot more capabilities. It also defines for a primary and secondary source for the cost. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit once I get into it. Uh, it can calculate a derived sales price based on a percentage uh, 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 markup it has. Uh, Oh, and, it, and, and also it's configured to reduce errors. And I'm going to show you what that means here in a second. <clears throat> I usually set up two calculation groups, one for pro production items, one for purchase items. So what you're seeing here is what I'm saying, I want to use the item cost price. Keep in mind, it's going to use standard cost this is for other costing methods. It's gonna use the item cost price, which is a plan cost. And if it doesn't have a plan cost, it's gonna use the inventory uh, cost. And if there's none, it's gonna ca calculate a zero. Why do I set it up this way? Well, let me explain. First off, the inventory price, and again, we're talking about non-standard cost. If there's no inventory, the inventory price is zero. The plan cost is the item cost price. It's usually a more, if people are using the system the way I think they need to be, it's a more reliable costing version. Now you could flip those around and you'd be perfectly correct also. You could say, cause some people say, give me inventory price first. If there's no inventory, give me the item cost price. Either one works. But I like to do it this way because it's the plan cost that usually I've built my costing assumptions on. And then I'm, I want to produce a variance to that if my assumptions on plan costs are not correct. So it all depends on how I want to look at my costing system. Then the other thing that's very important here is I also can get errors when I do my cost roll up using calculation groups. If I don't have a bomb in this case, it'll give me an error. If I have no route, it'll give me an error. If I have no resources associated with the route, it'll give me an error. If I've got a line where I'm not consuming anything, it'll give me an error. And if I have no cost price, it's gonna give me an error. What this means, and some people I seem to turn them off, if the item's not set up right, it's gonna tell you. If you don't have these turned on, it's gonna give you a cost. So if you take a disciplined approach on how you're gonna operate your costing system, and I believe that routings and bill of materials, people, uh, cost accountants, maybe they don't necessarily do them, but they certainly have to have a working knowledge of them. Um, if, you've got to define what those parameters are so you can, you can see if something doesn't happen. I certainly want to know if it calculates to zero, I want to know that there's no price out there. So I can look at it, why did that say it was zero? Is kind of the idea here. And here's the calculation group assigned to the product master. And also I just want to stress that at the calculation group is also defined in the inventory and warehouse parameters. And I would, I would suggest too that I usually set this up for what I ever have the most of. Um, but the, some people think if I set it up the more restrictive, like the production, uh, I'll catch the error if it's not set up. But in general, you can see that if I don't set it up on the item level, I clearly will catch a default. You'll notice that the system typically has a default for things you don't set up at the item level itself. Costing sheet, again, it was introduced in 2009. 
uh, up of that point, we didn't really have a good way of applying overhead. So it was primarily to provide a vehicle for calculating overhead, but also then it allows me to better define how I wanted my costing system to look. And then uh, I added the capability of, of the roll up for purchase orders in 2012. And again, this is a hard concept. When I tripped across it one time, I never saw it referenced any place. But I'm out looking at it, and I'm, I'm looking at the, the fact that well, I'm trying to set up a new cost, and it came up with this new element called uh, cost of purchase or something like that. <clears throat> and so I started working with it, and then I was able to find some references to it. But it allows me to add a standard, let's say, overhead factor to purchased items. So you actually do a purchased item cost roll-up. Um, we talked about the advanced overhead calculations. Uh, allows you to view your costing system the way you want. Also added, and this was in 2012, also added the capability of unit-based, and I don't know which version of 2012, but it's in R3 for sure. Provide for unit-based pricing, including weight and volume. And this is a big deal. Think about it from the standpoint of how I usually think about materials, particularly if I'm talking about bulk. When I look at bulk materials, many times I'm saying it's so much per pound to get it here. So that's kind of why this is really important. So I can say now on a purchase item that, all right, it's the item cost me $10, or let's say it cost me uh, $6 a gallon, but it also, it also cost me, let's say, 30 cents a pound to get it here. By the way, it can also be based on volume, which gallon would, a gallon would be a volumetric measure. But most of the time I've seen, people will break down these volumetric, uh, uh, volumetric measures into pounds because it's more consistent throughout the product line uh, in general, okay? And to me, that's one of the most significant improvements in the costing system is this whole costing sheet concept. And here's kind of what it looks like. You've got items which come from a bomb. Uh, and really what it's doing is providing the material cost groups through the roll up. Then uh, cost groups associated with cost categories go to the route. That's what gives your production cost group. And your indirect comes from your costing sheet. And that's kind of where, so we're saying one comes to route, one comes from the bomb. Actually, it's the items within the bomb. And one comes from the costing sheet. So here's what the costing sheets look like. So you'll notice that there's a cost of purchase and a cost of conversion. That is the, the production cost. You've got your materials identified here. You've got your labor buckets. You've got your overhead buckets. So that's where your breakdowns occur and how you design this costing sheet. And here's your purchase one. So I've got my materials, but then I've also got the ability to transport overhead, which I'm projecting as a percentage of the purchase price in this case. <clears throat> I did want to identify that you do have the ability to create a unit based. So when you look at surcharge, that's a percentage, a unit base now is based on some other factor like weight. And here's an example. I can base this uh, quantity, uh, let me go back, let me make sure I'm given the, this unit base surcharge can be either quantity, a, a, a cost per unit, a weight, cost per unit of weight, or a volume calculation okay and that like I said that's pretty significant and not that many people I, I don't know how many people know this but I've used it extensively once I found out about it because I really had I just found out about it actually and just started using it from there so again the resulting view and you've seen this it gives you an idea that's what the costing sheet gives you it gives you this breakdown now what we want to do is, and in this part I wanted to get to, that was kind of some review for some. Uh, the general, that applied what I just showed you to all costing systems, 
Now we're going to talk about just what the additional things you need for standard cost. So all the other stuff applies. Now we've got some things unique to standard cost and some what I think is some interesting things. In fact, one I just discovered myself the other day. So we're always learning in this business. Um, the cost framework. Important to note, and let me qualify this. This is 2012 and forward. So in the standard cost framework, that once you change standard cost now, the system revaluates, revalues all your inventory and WIP. And we're going to show you some of those transactions. So what it'll do is it'll do the adjustment. Didn't used to do that. So you had to, it was part of your inventory close or recalculation processes. Now, here are the advantages, they say. No inventory close process. I still recommend you do an inventory close, even if you're on 100% standard cost. The reason why is you've got something set up wrong, like you think it's standard cost and it's not, you'll identify it. It doesn't hurt anything to run it. I recommend you run it. Okay. It also, this new standard cost framework gave you opportunities to post the different types of variances with most people that's worked with sophisticated standard cost systems have not only variance, they have what type of variance. So, and we're going to cover that in details. There's something you need to understand about this though. You could have variance posted but no effect of variance. So let me explain. I could have maybe a material usage variance and then another variance that offset that variance. So the net variance is zero. So as long as you understand that it's going to post the variances, but it may not equate to a variance being posted in total to the ledger, it means you can't just look at one variance and say that's a variance. You gotta look at all of them if you're gonna break them out into those different variances. The advantage, you can see where the variance came from better. The disadvantage is you have to look at all of them to say what is the total variance. Um, and inventory, okay. And all I'm saying in the last one is that you, you it's maintained now. The inventory value is maintained. It's not an adjustment like it from the other classes, you know, LIFO, FIFO, those are all adjustments to the cost. The inventory value here is maintained at the standard cost. So that's why you could in theory say, I don't really need to do uh, inventory close. So what we're doing here then is when we look at these are the things we're doing. We're setting up the method for the different inventory model groups. But we're saying these are the groups that uh, we're breaking out the variances, okay? Uh, enable the production variance is another thing we're gonna do, and we'll show you how that's done. That will define the ledger accounts associated. And, and really, let me go back to this. What I'm saying is that since 2009, I have a real cost method called standard cost. Before 2009, it was a checkbox. All right, so what I'm saying is that you assigned it in the inventory model group. Okay, I enable the variances. If I want detailed variances, I'll show you where that's done. Then I'm gonna define the ledger accounts associated with them. I need to, uh, the, I need to set up the variances in what's called, in the prosting profile. And I must have multi-site multi functionality activated to use the standard cost framework, okay? I don't know if you have any of you out there do not have multi-site activated, but if not, you should. Um, but I want you to know multi-site is a requirement. And uh, a D365 is not a choice. Every region before, I believe it was a choice, but 2012, I can't remember for sure. If, it seemed like it wasn't a choice, but maybe it was. But before that, multi-site was a choice. Okay, here's the key that I'm suggesting here. 
by the way, what's exciting about this, as I was just studying the other day <clears throat> and found out, like I couldn't originally figure out what this did because I turned it on and off. I couldn't see where it did anything. Here's where it does something. If I say no, it does not produce sub-ledger sub detail that identifies these buckets. So what you had is no, nothing that actually was outside of the production system. So if you wanted to look at material labor and overhead, you had to look within a production order. What this subledger allowed us to do, and I'm hoping as a predecessor for something else downstream, in fact, I wanted to, I'm gonna write a design um, recommendation to Microsoft about this is that we don't have any way, and I don't get this too often, but I don't have any way to define material labor and overhead outside of the production order. <clears throat> Except I can see it in the subledger through reporting. That also makes it available through through reporting. Some people want to see inventory in the components of material labor and overhead and cost of goods sold in the in the values of material labor and overhead. I've only had that about four times in my entire career, so it must be unique to certain ways of accounting or accounting methodology. But what I'm really trying to suggest here that is in the cost control, what this does allows me to produce a sub-ledger which I can report against. It doesn't post to the general ledger, but it is a level of detail under the general ledger posting that now is available. If I say no, it doesn't produce this, this sub-ledger entry. All right? So if you look, there's some reporting if you look at that'll break down it, it break down the reporting by these components. If you don't have this turned on, that report doesn't give you that. So I would suggest turn that on if you're using the standard cost system. That allows you to see those values outside the production order. And the other one is you can also have variance to standard. You can either summary as summarized or per cost group. So what this means is summarize means you have one variance account per cost group. You can have you have many variance accounts. So it would work more like a traditional standard cost system where you'd produce uh, material labor and overhead variances is what you're looking at a lot of times. Otherwise, you get one variance number. <clears throat> so we enable the product variances. Again, it, it really all it does is allows you to, to identify the other variances like lot size, quantity, price, and substitutes and variances. And otherwise, you get summarized, you can only view a summarized production variance. Most, a lot of people summarize is fine. So here's how you set up the variances. So it's on your inventory management setup posting, posting. Here's your posting profiles, and there's a, a variance section in those posting profiles right here, your standard cost variance. Here's where you set up the different variances. By the way, we sell rounding variances. What They put that in whatever they don't know what else to do with it. So and that's been kind of a common uh, uh, thing that people kid about because nobody seems to be able to ever explain it but we get stuff in it it's really meant for small penny variances that occur between the calculations of the different levels so here's the uh, the variances they're talking about okay purchase price variances again a variance between planned purchase price and actual purchase cost. And when I say plan purchase price, I want to suggest that if you're using that roll-up method, that is inclusive of what you've calculated for those accruals for things like freight. Uh, cost change variance. 
change the standard cost. We're going to see that time permitting in, in some detail as to what happens when I change the standard cost. Also, it's to accommodate the transfer between two sites. In other words, I can have a site that effectively is at a different cost than the other site. In fact, it's very common because I might have a site that produces and a site that consumes. So it's also to have it's also to accommodate the transfer between two sites. Then the production variances, we have the very typical variances. I, I have a better detail of them, but price variance means that the price of the unit varied. Quantity variances mean the quantity uh, varied uh, that I expect to use. Lot size means that I made it in a different lot, so I want to accommodate this change in lot size as a variance. And then substitution variance means that I I did not use the items that I, I said I was going to use. That will produce a variance. So sometimes a substitution variance, you can have a substitution variance, but you get a favorable um, quantity variance. Because it's, it's the same, like well, it could be a same product with this, it could be a different product with the same cost, in other words, is kind of the idea. That's why you've got to look at them as a total. So price variance. What the price variance is, is again, it's the difference between the cost that are in the standard cost calculation that were the costs that were used for the actual consumption. The biggest place where we get price variance is that the roll up, remember, when I, when I create a production order, I am going to do an estimate based on the current bomb and routing, the current bomb and routing. To me, that's kind of like the current cost. My standard cost could be different. What the price variance is to capture the difference between the estimated cost and what I would call the standard cost. I hope that makes sense because it's critical. Okay. Yeah, we don't an understanding. Say yeah. Don, we don't have any questions in the queue right now, but uh, just to stop for a moment and say, mm -hmm. are there any questions or issues with regard to that? With the variances? If so, yeah. We'll just take a minute and answer those now. The only reason why I say it's important is because most people don't realize this. Ah, gotcha. Okay, so I want to make sure that that's why I'm signing out later, because they'll look at it and say, I don't know why I'm getting this. I performed exactly to my estimate. I should not have produced a variance. Well, again, you've got to look at your your activated standard costs. If there's a difference between that and your estimated cost. That's where the price variance is going to come from. So it's not within the production order. That's why people get confused. That's the reason why I'm making kind of a big deal about it. Okay? And no questions, so go ahead. Okay. Just want to take yeah. that break and give folks a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And quantity variance then comes from in, and it's not necessarily quantity, it's that the amount planned at standard compared to the amount consumed at standard. So think about quantity variances within the production order. Okay? So quantity, and that's why you can take the difference. If you take the quantity variance, that means I consumed less dollars than I planned for. The price variance is that there's a difference in what I planned and what the standard cost is. Okay. Lot size difference has to do with standard lot sizes and cost at standard lot sizes. <clears throat> what it's going to try to do it look at performance standards and let's it's now this gets complex when you look at process manufacturing what it will do is it will look at all these things but throw in one other thing it says when i create a standard lot size i effectively have calculations asso associated with that lot size it kind of says if the lot size is different 
I'm going to apportion part of this to a lot size variance. And what that says is the standard cost per unit came out okay. The quantity came out okay. Or as far as my consumed, but my yield was different. Like I consumed enough materials to make the 10 I said I was going to make, or it should be like 10,000 gallons, but the cost that I get that got consumed did not consume a linear outcome. So only nine came out of it. Or let's say 10,300 pounds came out of it or something like that. It says that can be a difference between the lot size. So it apportions that as a yield loss is what it is. So think of a yield loss, think of lot size variance. Because uh, remember, process manufacturing is not always linear. Discrete manufacturing typically is linear. In the substitution variance we kind of talked about, that's when I used a different product. So if I use a different product than what the original bomb calls for, it's going to give me a substitution variance. But it may offset that with another variance. I just, that's what I want to stress there, okay? Understanding how Santa Cross works in the manufacturing environment. Okay. Here's our production posting. So we'll start with material consumption. Material consumption comes from a Picklist journal. The Picklist journal says these are materials I've issued to that production order. That creates the following voucher transactions. And that's a physical cost. And really what it's doing is it's actually posting this voucher in these costs to the production process. And let me just go back through here. I just wanted to make a point here. Just so you know, I, I'm not showing you the ledger breakout here. But what you'd be doing is you would be crediting an inventory account and debiting a WIP account. Just so you know, typically I use a one single WIP account rather than WIP labor, WIP material, WIP material, WIP overhead because I don't see a huge advantage to doing it. And also it just incorporates so many other possibilities with posting it incorrectly. So if you always think anything coming into production comes to WIP, anything coming out of production comes from WIP, breaking it down any further, I don't see the advantage because I can see the breakdown in the production order. But if you need to, you can, okay? Then now we look at the route consumption, 4750. The route consumption comes from a job card or um, what is a rate card, I think. The only difference between the two, just so you know, is rate card says you've got to combine operation, all this detail. Job card puts it all in a job. So that when you say this job, it represents to what operation, uh, you know, what step, what operation, all that kind of stuff. On manufacturing execution, or for people in older versions, the shop floor control, I never was able to get it work, working on anything but job cards. So it's a job oriented, and I think that's why they kind of incorporate this job card construct to have it work with the manufacturing execution or shop floor control, which is a Automate as a labor collection system is what it really is, labor and quantity collection system. Right, so you can see that came from the route consumption. So everything comes from a journal, it's important. Okay, here's your route consumption. So here's the actual voucher transactions. So you get the idea. Here's your direct labor applied, here's your production whip. By the way, we also have some overhead. Okay, so when I posted this, I actually posted overhead also. <clears throat> now, I want to stress that I recommend, and I don't know if I have this represented here, your, pr product your production posting I recommend you use the cost category to establish your general ledger accounts. So what I'm showing you here in this example 
where the ledger accounts came from. It came from the cost category, and that's a setup on the uh, inventory warehouse. Uh, uh, no, it's in the production parameters table. You can either tie it to the, the resource or work center. You can tie it to some kind of production group or the cost category. The reason why I recommend cost category is cost categories are typically controlled specifically by finance. Resources and work centers are typically not. You have a better you have a better opportunity, I think, to get the ledger postings right by using that. Keep in mind that the uh, uh, financial dimensions can come from the group or uh, from the uh, um, resources, but I recommend that you only do I, dimensions there. Don't have your ledger accounts post from there. Okay, so oh yeah, here I'm sh I'm sh actually showing it. Okay, so what I'm recommend is you use item and category. By the way, it defaults to item and resource. Just so you know. Okay, and here's, and I'm showing the indirect ledger posting comes from the cost sheet. So let me go back. This is where the labor posting came from. Okay, and if I go back to one, that's where this one came from. Okay, by the way, notice this posting type. Look at this detail here. Look at this detail. So if you want to look at the ledger, that tells you what account this was. All right, so you get that. So I want to make sure you understood this tie too. So when you're trying to troubleshoot. Um, and then again, we can do this by item and category. Now here's the, where the indirect posting, that was the second set of ledger postings. It came from this rate and it based on process time. So when I posted labor, it created an overhead transaction that posted these ledger accounts. And did I show Show the rate here. I guess I don't show the rate, but if I go to previous, I think I break it down further. But just so you know, that was a rate. That's a dollars per labor hour is what that posting is represented of. Okay. Now here's the report is finished posting. What you're going to do here is here's your transaction. It's the report is finished journal. Again, everything results no matter what the front end is in a journal posting. So what I said, I posted nine good, okay, for in this tram, a report is finished. That gave me these postings. You'll notice that estimated finished goods inventory, production whip material, so we credited whip, debited finished goods, Again, keep in mind these posting types because they're important in tying it to the source. And by the way, we got this indirect cost posting of 1350. If you remember back where we had that tooling amortization uh, discussion, which they called it machine depreciation, that was based on a quantity. So what we're saying is based on nine, nine times a dollar fifty. I'm certainly hoping comes in up to thirteen fifty, but uh, but again, that's where that's coming from. Is that, and I think I break it out further, but just so you understand where that's coming from, it happened to be posted when I post reported as finished. So uh, yeah, and here's where it came from. Subtype is quantity, it's repost, posting at $1.50 a piece. Now we get into another material consumption. Now this is interesting. I've already got my material consumption up here. What can this be? By the way, this was not by design, it's just by something I did and ended up seeing this. So I thought, well, let's show you this. 
This came is in the middle of this production order was open. I made a change to standard cost. So what this material consumption is, is represented to the changes that were made in standard cost. And to give you an idea, it was a dollar something or something like that. But what's important to know, let's say, let's go here. And I'll... You'll notice this is 2205. Oh, I can just click on it. Here's what's important of the way AX works. And I'm going to make an, a point, too, on some of the other stuff. When you look sometimes at a journal, it can't differentiate where in the journal it came from. So it's going to show you that whole journal. The 22 is in there. The math works. But it's showing you all of the transactions that it did when I changed that standard cost. Because changing the standard cost affected anything that was not ended yet. All right? So it's showing you all of the things that it did. And here's all I did. I changed the standard cost from $27.80 to $30. That produced all that. But that's also why you don't have to do it in, in the inventory close. It does it real time. It did it on A25. And then here's your costing portion. And really, all I'm showing here, let me ex explain. I wanted to show you a variance from posting. All right? That 110, by the way, I think was the difference between the delta and standard cost. I'm pretty sure. I'd have to go back and look at it. I'm pretty sure where that came from. Because, uh, but, the key here is that, uh, in fact, I'm not positive that's what it was, but here's what the key here. I didn't show you all the posting because it reverses everything out and puts it back in, but here's the only thing. Oh, yeah, it came, oh, came, that's what, that's one cent. All it did, it produced a variance and posted at standard cost after finished goods. So reversed everything, you get a variance. <clears throat> And a reposting of the fight. Everything else that happens in between, the only thing you're worried about, does it properly balance to the right account? The only thing important to know about this closing is it reverses everything out, reposts everything, and creates a variance. Because the first time in a standard cost system, it posted its standard cost. The second time it reverses and reposts it, it posted the standard cost. The only difference is now it has the total cost accumulated and it can produce a variance. Understand the effects of changing standard costs. I think we just saw one, but we just saw this example, inventory result of production, review of production costing. So it did. It has all these revaluations it goes through, and that, standard, that comes from the standard cost transaction set of information, which results in the ledger posting that you saw. All right? So, and, and, oh, I do want to, I think I'll, yeah, I think I'll go through, and if not, I'll go back. Let me go back a, a couple previous things. I know we're running short, but I want, there's a point I need to make. There's probably a better way to do this, I'm sure. You'll have material consumption and in indirect. I want to make sure you know that when you look at the voucher, it's inclusive of both of these. Okay, so it's like represented twice. So don't let this throw you off with saying, here's the material. This $14, I'm pretty sure. Well, one of them's based on this material consumption, one's based on the route consumption. All right? And that's the same here. Here's. Uh, 
that's just a little bit of route consumption here. But the key is I want to make sure you know that indirect cost is because, again, AX can't break the voucher up very easy. You can't say that this part was the indirect cost. It says when we posted this, uh, in the case of material, this pick list, we had components of material and components of indirect. And I'm just representing that here. I hope that makes sense. But um, if you, when you look at it in detail, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. I just put this out here. Now, this is the, these 365. There's a lot of reports. You'll just have to look for these reports in other versions, but this is D365. There are more reports here than we had before. And these are production control reports. This is in the production part of the system. And I'm not going to go through every one of them. We don't have time to do that. But then you've got in the management reports your value reports, and including the value statement standard cost breakdowns provided you set that flag to allow the uh, subledger. Then the cost management, we have all these reports that are available. That was more I just wanted to identify those. Okay, so boy, I'll tell you, I'm gonna be right about on schedule. Things you must do to maintain a good standard cost environment. Okay, here's the things that I, I think Again, and some of we covered, there must be some cost accounting oversight to ending production orders. Whether you set the standards and maybe you make it so that if one doesn't complete, like you, you make sure that flags off, then those are the ones you look at. That's fine. Another thing for every financial period, make sure all your journals are posted. Do not leave journals sitting out there. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out to a site. And there'll be 300 unposted journals sitting out there. Um, uh, there's a reason why they're out there. And you need to identify what they are and get rid of them. Um, again, identify before you close. Once it's closed, you can't fix it in the production order. There's another thing, though, I want to make sure you know, and I cover this in other sections. That does not mean that that's ended. The posting to that production order has ended. It just means that you can't post to it. And let me illustrate. When I do a recalculation or an end, if there's differences between physical cost and, and, and um, financial cost, it can, in fact, post to the production order, make a change to the variance, and so it can make changes to the outcome. But it comes in as an adjustment. And just so you know, when we cover the inventory close, we'll go over that in detail. We touched a, lot, a little bit on it in the first session. But we go in great detail as to this inventory close process and what it does and what's important about it. Um, again, we talked about it not spanning more than one financial period when possible. Uh, maintain standards improvements. And then make sure you understand your additional costing considerations for uh, process manufacturing or batch orders. Okay, let's just, we've got some time. Let's cover these couple over. Well, we do have a few questions too. <laughs> well, let's go to the questions and then if time permitted, I can get you to stay a couple more sections. I, there's that one section I want to cover. The other one I think is redundant. So what questions do we have? Um, I kind of went through that pretty quick, so I hope, but that was 104 slides, by the way. So that's a lot of slides for the time period. Right. So the first question is, to analyze root variances, is there a way to put comments Let's say the operator took four hours to make a job that's usually supposed to be done in one. Mm -hmm. As a manufacturing accountant, I would like to know why in order to help adjust the process from the route card or the shop floor. Okay. Well, as far as notes, most of the time you can put a note on the production order, and I think you can do that up until it's closed. Uh, there, you can put notes just about every place. It's just a question of can you use them? Because just because you put them any place doesn't mean they go any place. Um, other than that option, just so you know, when we're analyzing variances, we're typically trying to analyze them over time. And I would submit that 
that's something that their reporting doesn't do very well. So what I would recommend is you take some of their standard outputs and either put them in a spreadsheet or something like Access, or you invest in a BI solution to do things like where we're trying to compare variances over time. You'll notice you can find out everything you want to know in one production order, but trying to know what happened over a thousand is harder to do because people seem uh, developers don't think in that paradigm. I don't think uh, they think about what we want to know in this production order. Then they might reduce that, but there are some reports you might be able to get it from. But my suggestion to you is that. You analyze over time, and the best way to do that is probably to export it into some kind of spreadsheet kind of value. And there is an ability, if you look at 365 now, it's better than previous versions in this area. Uh, 2012 being almost as good, quite frankly. Uh, think about how the other things you don't have and how to get there. Because really, the best way is to look at variance over time and then kick out the outliers like that one where we didn't post, you know, we, or I would suggest, again, you see where I'm going with it is you got to analyze over time before you ch typically change your standard. Do you want to look for uh, a true consistent variance of going a certain direction to understand whether my standards are bad? Okay. Next question. Yeah. And this is the final one from Carol, and she says, we're on AX 2012. I know mm -hmm. that there are users on production floor who use RAF with accept error. I'm not sure the reason why this is done, but I wonder if there is a way to view all production orders with the accept error equals Y. Well, uh, no, because it doesn't it doesn't keep that flag. But here's what it really means. You really need to do. Any there are in 2012 some variance reports. And there's also some variance postings. Here's what I do. I filter out all my variances and I sort them based on the value. Positive or negative. And that's what I look at when I'm trying to audit a system to see how they're performing. And uh, a part of what I'm going to cover about that is in that previous slide, too, I want to do. And it won't take that long, so I, 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 I'd like to go ahead and cover that if I can. But again, what I suggest to you is, is if you're in a standard cost system managed by the variance, because the variance is produced by one of two things. Either they, they didn't post everything or you didn't perform. Either, those are the two things. And the reason why you don't like that except error on is because you can't rule out one of them. <laughs> so you, it, you know, you can't rule out the fact they didn't post everything. So I know that's not the answer you want, but in general, I do it by variance. If you didn't produce a variance, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but if you produce a big variance, you should look at it. Okay. Any other ones? Nope. That's it. Okay, well, let me cover this because I think it's important. It's always a lively conversation if I can find my mouse again. I don't know why. You got to back up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, I think the other one was redundant, so let's not worry about that. Well, let me just go just to see if there's anything important there. We covered that one, so let's cover this one. This I get asked all the time, and all I can do is give you some guidance, and I see the value in any of the costing methods, but it depends to me on the nature of your, your company. First off, what's the best costing method? To do any co some people think that actual costing is less work. The answer is no, it's not. It's the same amount of work. It just, to do it right is the same amount of work. It means that in an actual costing environment, 
you must establish a plan cost. What's a plan cost? It's basically establishing a standard that you can compare against. Also, in absence of inventory, it's also a transactional cost. I'll give you a quick example. If you cycle count all your inventory out, and then you cycle count the inventory back in, if you don't have a plan cost, all the inventory will come in at zero. The reason why is when you cycle count all the inventory out, there then is no inventory cost because there's no inventory. I, I've, I've had this question asked hundreds of times. And so a plan cost operates in absence of being able to establish an inventory cost. Now the next course is a distribution company. If most of your most of your products come as a distributor, you have little control over the cost of that product. So you're not using using standard. You're trying to actually compare cost over time. But manufacturing companies tend to use standards, and the reason why is standards identify for them where their problems are, and it forces somebody to look at it. The illustration I usually use is if you made a 20,000 error in an actual costing system, nobody may ever see it. If you make a 20, if you if something kicks out a $20,000 variance, somebody's probably going to look at that. So I think that standard cost helps you in maintaining your standards and also identifies the whether or not the assumption of cost are proper or not. On the case of a distributed product, you really don't uh, have a lot of control over the cost, but still you used to have a plan cost, then you compare that plan cost to your physical transactions that occurs. Again, standard cost identifies costing errors easier. It produces a variance that sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, also, if you're going to use a non-standard cost environment, or non, if you're not going to use, you, I recommend weighted average date. Weighted average date is how, how the product natively executes in a non-standard cost environment. So in weighted average date is what we all used to call weighted average. Weighted average means it keeps an average based on the transactions that come in. Uh, and it establishes costs at the time that transaction occurs. Uh, weighted average is different in AX. It, it takes it for the whole period. The reason why I recommend weighted average date is that any other cost, with the exception of standard, which you always separate that, is an adjustment. LIFO doesn't then happen until I do a recalculation which creates an adjustment to weighted average date transaction to give me that transaction in the uh, FIFO layer. So it's an adjustment. And just uh, to close, I can't tell you how many times I've went out to a site. I've done a lot of costing reconciliations and helping people fix their cost system and teaching a lot of cost accountants. I'll go out and I'll say, what's their costing method? And they'll proudly tell me, we're on FIFO. Uh, well, the next question I'll ask them is, how often did you do a recalculation and inventory close? The answer to that is, what's that? The key there is they've never been on FIFO costing the whole life of that system because it doesn't occur until you do those processes. And that will be covered in great detail in the next session. How's that? Awesome. That's perfect, John. <laughs> okay. Thank and you. I'm only seven minutes yeah. over. Yeah, there yeah. are any uh, questions in the queue. So I'm going to wish you all a good week. I'm going to close the webinar and remind you to join us for sessions three and four. Just go out to the website. Click on upcoming webinars and you can get yourself registered. So thank you very much and everyone have a great week.